Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. I am on set of an episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, a show that I somehow started in one of the most, most volatile, polarizing times in this country. Man, this picture honestly makes me speechless because this whole concept of the last five months really make me speechless. It's, uh, it's crazy to think about. In the midst of all this chaos in our world, so many of y'all have reached out to me, and by y'all, I mean white people. They reached out to me asking, how can I help? I, as a black man in America, said I gotta do something. I can't sit on the sideline my whole life and, and, and do nothing. And I said, okay, I know white people, and I know black people. And because I know white people and black people, I know that there's a, a disconnect in communication. And so I said, let me try to bridge that communication barrier. And I sat in front of an all white wall, nine minutes, 27 seconds, the first episode, no teleprompter, no script, just from my head and from my heart. And I spoke to stand with us and people that look like me. You have to be educated on issues that pertain to me and fully educated so that you can feel the full level of pain so that you can have full understanding. I hope everyone realizes they have the ability to change the world around them. Don't be scared of doing anything because you cannot do everything. Just because just, just you can't do everything doesn't mean you don't do anything at all. I didn't do it to be famous. I didn't do it to go viral. I just did it to make change and I'm so grateful to God that it happened. This was a family photo shoot. Uh, I might have been We'll call it 10 years old. Yeah, it was at that age where I first started hearing the phrases like, Emmanuel, you don't even talk like you're black. Or Emmanuel, you don't even dress like you're black. Or Emmanuel, you're like an Oreo. Black on the outside, white on the inside. At the time, I didn't realize how racially insensitive that was, how racist that was, because that's to imply that I sound too intelligent to be black. And that was probably my first stages of introduction to racial insensitivity or just overt racism. Racism to me, I thought was a picture of something when in fact racism could just be a word. Be confident in who you are. See, I started to question my own blackness because so many non-black people were telling me I wasn't black or at least I wasn't that black. I would tell my younger self, I would tell uh, someone that age, don't become insecure in who you are based on what other people say about you. This is another family portrait, and I vividly remember this one. This is on a Sunday, I think after church once again, and that's my older brother, my two sisters, and my parents, obviously. It wasn't so much what my family taught me, it's what they did for me. See, sometimes I encourage people to talk because Talk is the easiest barrier of entry. The most important thing my family did, we went to Nigeria every summer on a medical mission trip. And in doing that, I realized only by grace, latitude and longitude am I blessed to be in America. And so as a result, to whom much is given, much is required. Problem in our society, one of the biggest as far as lacking racial reconciliation is we don't know what other people are going through, what they've gone through and how they exist. If you don't expose yourself to different cultures, to different colors, to different races, to different religions, then you'll navigate your life out of fear instead of out of care for one another. This is my senior year in high school. I went to a school called St. Mark's. That's my beautiful mother right there. Uh, I look a mess, obviously, but somehow my mom is still willing to tolerate my smell because that's what mothers do. They love you unconditionally. So high school, again, I graduated with maybe five black people. Then I go to college and I'm on a team with, you know, maybe 90 um, black people. And so I was like, wait a second, I'm home. Like, y'all look like me. Y'all talk like me. Like, y'all dress like me. When I got to college, I realized so much of what I had learned about people who look like me was a lie. See, because I grew up in Nigerian culture. And so I didn't necessarily grow up black culture. So now I get to college amongst um, my black brothers and sisters and I realized, oh, there's so much beauty, so much uh, confidence, so much charisma, so much talent amongst black people. So in college was really when I had my biggest awakening moment. Because I grew up immersed in white culture, 
I had an identity crisis when I got to college because I was a nerdy private school kid amongst a team full of jocks. But I would say don't worry about the time you miss because what I went through in high school versus what I went through in college, it's made me who I am today and it's equipped me to have the conversations I've been having. I've now made it to the National Football League. That is my brother, Sam Macho. We played for nine years. Um, he played four years for the Arizona Cardinals. He's in the red and black jumpsuit. I'm playing for the Philadelphia Eagles. And so we had to grab a picture pre-game because two brothers playing against each other, National Football League, there's nothing like that. Um, so that, yeah, that was a special moment. It was an eye-opening experience because it was, again, exposure to much different culture. Like there's one thing in high school, like I told you, predominantly white culture. Then I'm in college, but in college, you got black people from the country, black people from the city, black people from uh, the, the, the projects. Then you get to the NFL and now everybody has money. So I say money doesn't change you, money exposes you. So now I'm being exposed to the highlights of every different type of culture, specifically black culture. But it was, it was an awesome time in my life. I wouldn't change that for anything.